you are here for the evidence show. I apologize. The button on my shirt just broke. So that's been fun. That's always awkward and weird, but we won't spend much time talking about that. We'll get right to the subject at hand. This is the evidence show. And the first thing I'd like to do is to continue to point people to Facebook. It's not just for marketplace anymore. Uh, that's another place where you can go and get your questions answered about evidence issues. I think we have over a thousand people on that forum right now, and it's for evidence custodians. It started during the pandemic when we couldn't speak to one another uh, in person. Well, now that we can, it's still a great resource. So I would encourage you to, to sign up and, and uh, ask questions and reach out and help people that have questions. That's the whole benefit of that. And as always, I start off kind of giving credit where credit is due, giving a couple of shout outs. It's only been one for a long, long time. They've kept the lights on, Tracker Products. They make software for evidence custodians and you should check them out at trackerproducts.com. I don't wanna bury the lead here, but uh, we have a second ad. If I can click it, it's Gunbusters. <laughs> Wave, Scott, say hello. Hello, how are you guys? Uh, Gunbusters has also started to partner with us, and we're excited about that. We'll introduce you to them in just a little bit, so pretend like this part didn't exist, but I wanted to put the slide there anyways. If you're curious about what Gunbusters does, check them out at gunbustersusa.com. And if you don't know what they do, we'll explain that here in just a little bit. Um, this will be one of those shows that goes a little bit smoother the more questions that people ask. So uh, ask questions as they come up. We will also not be able to cover everything related to firearms, especially if you're from the state of California uh, in this show. But we will talk a little bit about some things and not about others. So give us a shout. And we'll move on from there. This is our website, evidencemanagement.com. Please check that out. Uh, all of the resources that we have, uh, period, are, well, not, I guess, live classes, but you can find them on our website. You might have to sign up for the little client login to access some of the documents, but uh, we would encourage you to do so. We make that stuff free for you 24 seven. So we're there even when we're not there. But this is episode 31 of season four of The Evidence Show, a riveting crime drama that we've been doing for the last four years. We're gonna talk about breaking out the big guns today. Uh, really more specifically, we're gonna talk about breaking them up into small little pieces. And we'll also talk about other things related to guns, but we wanted a catchy title. So what are we talking about? First thing, we'll talk about something really cool. The second thing, we're gonna do some announcements, talk about some training where we're gonna be. Then we'll kind of flesh out our newest training partnership and then we'll get to the stuff about guns, but I promise you we'll try to spend most of our time talking about guns, especially if you ask questions. Uh, so the really cool thing, it, it was cool to me, it might not be cool to you, is you know we've been at this for a while and today we broke a thousand people that are registered for this little webinar series and community. There aren't a thousand of you here at any one time, but there are a thousand of you that get the emails and about 300 that I get bounce backs saying that you're out of your office, which is great, it's great. But, uh, you know, it was cool for me to log in and see that we've had a thousand people sign up for this thing over the last few years and, and we still uh, have people showing up like you, you just showed up today, we appreciate it. So, you know, that was something I thought was really cool. You might not, but you know, I did. Uh, if you are tuning in to find out whether or not you were awarded one of the grants from our Christmas Minor Miracle episode, well, we're still not there, but we will soon, I promise. We always deliver, sometimes it's late, but we've been on the road a lot, and by we, I mean me, because James, who is listening in the audience, is now working for Tracker as a salesperson, call James, uh, but... Uh, we will get it out there, I promise. So another thing that we didn't forget, if you watched our last episode, one of the things that we were talking about, or the only thing we were talking about was trying to find ways to end canine drug training aid programs at local agencies. I was at the CAPE conference last week, or maybe last 
two weeks. I don't remember. It was sometime recently in the past. Uh, talked to a couple of people that are still doing it. Um, well, we talked about a resource on the show for getting rid of those programs or giving you a guide to help take that conversation to your agency. So our document is right there somewhere in the corner of your screen right now. It's called the best practice, canines and cocaine. I prefer to call it a few good reasons why we should stop giving our cocaine to canines, because really that's what canine training aid programs do. This is a reference. It's available on our website. I am about 60% confident that it is there, but it, I am 100% confident that you can download it from the handouts section on this webinar. So if you're watching live, great. If not, I'll check the website later and make sure it's on the web. A few more announcements. We just like, we just got back from Cape. That was awesome. We did a presentation out there. That was a lot of fun. Uh, it's a great conference. I love state conferences and we try to partner with them as often as we can. We will be at four more this year. Uh, we'll be at PEEF in Florida on Daytona Beach in May. That's one I will probably never, ever, ever miss, ever because it's on a beach, it's a conference on a beach. Why would you not go? I would encourage you to go to PEEF if you live in you know, Idaho. It's a, it's a great conference and it's on Daytona Beach. We'll be there in May doing a presentation. One of the fun things that we're doing is we're combining our two-day training classes with state association conference training. So we're offering our two-day certification training at the NIPIT conference in September. So if you're in New Mexico, sign up for that conference and you can attend our training class as a part of that. And the same thing with MAPE in Missouri, the Missouri Association, their conference in November. We'll be doing a two-day training class there. And we'll be doing some training at the OAPEA conference in Oregon. Love going out to Oregon. Uh, we'll also be doing another two-day class out there. So trying to get rid of the, the laundry list of catch up things. Our two day classes, standalone classes, we're gonna be out in Kansas City, Missouri. We have maybe one or two more spots in that class. It's filling up really fast. We'll be there May 10th and 11th. We'll be in Greeley, Colorado, uh, July 18th and 19th. And I will be on the Big Thompson River on the 17th and the 20th. So if you wanna go, we can have a fly fishing and evidence certification training all packed into one if you get there early. In fact, we should offer that, but that would be fun. We'll be in uh, the Atlanta area in Lawrenceville, Georgia, September 6th and 7th. We'll also be heading out to Miami in the early fall and back in Oregon sometime late summer, early fall. One of the cool things, oh yeah, that's no cost. We're gonna skip that slide in the interest of time, but the classes don't cost you anything. You can go, the reason they don't cost you anything, this guy sitting here and Tracker Products, they are the ones that provide the training to you for free. Free doesn't mean it doesn't cost anything. It doesn't mean it's not worth anything. It means you don't have to pay for it. Um, one of the cool things we're excited about, if you're in Indiana, in the state of Indiana, the Hoosier state, uh, where my sister lives, we're gonna start, we're gonna try to get a, an evidence association started in Indiana for the first time. Um, that uh, that class, well, actually not a class. I just lost track of time and space. May 16th at 11.30 a.m. at the Fort Wayne Police Department training facility. If you're in the state of Indiana, would love to invite you to come out and talk with us about starting an association for the state of Indiana. Um, we'll be doing that May 16th. So if you're anywhere near Fort Wayne or if you're in the state of Indiana, we would love to see you there. We'd love to have representation from across the state. I know that that's not possible all the time, but I want to give you a little advance notice. We're really excited about the prospect of starting a new evidence association. They are the absolute best resource uh, for you as an evidence custodian that is available. So, and now a word from our sponsors. Now, I wish that I could do this smoothly. It's not going to be smooth, but I'm going to play a little video here. And just pretend it's smooth. Pretend that this is like a well-oiled machine and that 
I've lost it somewhere. Okay, here we go. All right, stand by. Now let's reset. Let's just pretend that that didn't happen. There we go. Are you struggling with an overcrowded property room? Destroy your agency firearms the safe, simple, and secure way with gun busters. Firearms are destroyed using the Gun Busters Firearms Pulverizer. Each firearm is destroyed individually and video recorded to ensure proof of destruction. Each video displays the make, model, and serial number of the firearm that is being destroyed. Your agency name and evidence or case number is also displayed. Each video captures the time and date of each firearm's full destruction. Gunbusters destruction videos are provided to the department and are searchable by serial number and agency evidence number. With the Gunbusters ATF approved destruction method and video documented proof of destruction, your department can rest assured that each firearm has been successfully destroyed. The time is now to clean out your property room with Gunbusters. All right, can you hear me? Oh, yes. All right. Hopefully you could hear that video. If if not, that was just a minute and 22 <laughs> se seconds of awkward silence. Hopefully you're able to see it. Scott, say hello. Hello. Yes, thank you. Um, glad this to be here. Glad we can sponsor your classes. Yeah, this is Scott Reed. He's with Gunbusters. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Gunbusters, if stuff that maybe wasn't in the video? Sure. So we have been in business for about 10 years. Uh, we started out in the firearms business, actually helping agencies sell guns. Um, and then we got more and more requests of, you know, how can we destroy guns? And, you know, we had some methods of chop saws and stuff like that, but nothing that was really, uh, nothing that really helped, you know, maintain the chain of custody for guns and the end of life cycle. So uh, we finally came to, hey, we can shred the guns, but if we document it, video record it, and then provide those videos back to the department, that's really going to be the most benefit to them because then they can maintain their chain of custody all the way through the end of the guns. Uh, cleans out property rooms, so you're only maintaining digital evidence instead of actual physical evidence of things that can get stolen. Uh, you know, if somebody steals your videos, nobody cares. If somebody steals your guns, that's a big problem. So uh, that's how we came to be. Um, things we didn't address in the video, our services are completely free for law enforcement agencies. Uh, we do serve the entire United States, either through our headquarters in Missouri or through one of our licensees across the country. Um, but yeah, it's a, a free service. We make our money, we sell parts of the firearms, and then we sell the resulting scrap of the parts that we do shred. It's an ATF approved process. Um, so it meets ATF's destruction standards. Uh, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, you get a copy of our ATF records, which is the same stuff that a federal firearms license would have to provide to ATF. So you get that and you get the destruction videos. Um, so it should, in theory, uh, make your lives a lot easier, and the process should be very simple for anybody to use. Awesome. Now, who's taking those guns apart? Is it just people with, like, crowbars? and? Nope. So we actually have a team of gunsmiths that we hire. Um, it's a strange job for them because they are gunsmiths that never have to put firearms back together. They only have to go one way. Uh, so they disassemble them. And then once they are that way, then we shred them in our unit and uh, scrap the resulting metal. Awesome. A couple of things that I like about Gunbusters. One is that you have gun bust, you have gunsmiths on staff that actually do the 
the disassembly and I, because they're they're trying to mine that stuff for serviceable usable safe parts um they're a great resource by the way if you got firearms questions reach out to scott uh, yes please do especially like with identification of firearms which can get pretty tricky what is it pre-61 or 64 pre-68 pre rifles and shotguns 68. yeah like those give people fits all the time because there aren't any markings on them but they uh, weren't required to have serial numbers yes that's yeah. yeah so which is a particularly vexing problem for people <laughs> like me who are trying to find serial numbers now here's a question for you oh and you if you got questions do type them in the little thing uh, do you accept biohazard guns? That's a great question. Yes, absolutely. Um, so we have ultrasonic cleaning tanks that we take. Um, once our guys get the guns, they get segregated in our vaults as, hey, this is biohazard, so this needs something else done to it before it gets touched. Uh, typically, typically, we like to get the guns um, in as little packaging as possible, but for biohazard, leave them in the bags or whatever you have that way when they're transported they're still safe and when our gunsmiths get them they're still safe but yes we clean them in an ultrasonic cleaning tank so yes but we can't accept those that's a great question uh yeah that's that's a, another particularly vexing problem with dispositions is what do you do with those guns that have other stuff left behind on them so thanks for asking that and they will take care of it so I will tell yes. you just a, a couple things that I like about Gunbusters. Uh, you know, we're to, we're not going to talk the whole time about Gunbusters, but I'm I'm thrilled to have them as a part of our kind of partnership network. Uh, for years, it's just been Tracker keeping the lights on for us. Gunbusters is helping us out. Uh, they are the reason we're able to provide training for free because they've partnered with us. They've got a, a stake in it, and you know, really all they're asking in return is just a chance to talk to folks and to come out to our training classes and take care of people and answer their questions there and and, and that's it. And they really, both both companies, one of the things that I love about both of them on the tech side, Tracker will, will try to answer your tech questions and answer your tech questions honestly. Same thing with, with Gunbusters. They've got, if you got disposition questions, they will answer them. Another question I have is what if you're in a state, Scott, now this is a preloaded, mm -hmm predetermined question that I did not ask earlier. Uh, what if you're in a state that requires people to sell their guns? Is there any reason why gun busters would be a benefit to a state like that? Sure. Um, this morning, actually, I finished a uh, destruction for Lake Havasu in Arizona, and they are mandated sale. Um, so normally they sell other guns. Now what we got from them are illegally modified guns. So some short cut down barrels and a bunch of defaced guns. So we are still able to take all of the defaced guns in um, and we destroyed them for them. Um, good thing about defaced guns is, you know, instead of just saying, hey, I destroyed, you know, nine defaced guns, we actually attach the case number to each gun. So it's the defaced gun that came from this case. It's the defaced gun that came from this case. So you can actually differentiate them when you, if you had to go back and sort through your uh, files or evidence. But yes, Very we can good. still provide some help to uh, those states where they are required to sell them. And my last kind of softball question. So do you just, did you just stick up a shingle or do you have, I mean, why are you able to accept these guns from all over the world? Uh, so we are, we are a federal firearms licensed dealer. So in theory, we, um, what? not in theory, I mean, you could buy a gun from us. We don't sell guns. We haven't ever sold a gun in our existence, um, but you could buy guns from us, but we are subject to ATF as any gun store would be. So if ATF wants to, and they have on a number of occasions, they can come in and audit us and say, hey, where did these guns come from? We can tell them that, and they, where did these guns go? Not only can we tell them that, we can show them. So. Uh, yes, it's an extra layer of accountability because as federal firearms licensees holders, we are the last record holder of any firearm. So if you did run into a trace, you could say, yep, we had that gun. It came from this case. We turned it over to Gunbusters. They would call us. We can say, yes, we absolutely have this gun. Uh, we you know, destroyed it. Here's the video. It's destruction. All right. Now, it, this might be a record for the evidence show. We have lots of questions coming in, so I'm going to ask you a lot of questions. That's actually that cool. I, I've been dreaming of a day when people would ask me this many questions. And so far, there are like six questions, which in the four-year history of this show is 
three more questions than we've been asked before. <laughs> so do you have a minimum amount of guns that you need to have to deliver? So typically, no. Um, and we can do it one of two ways. Um, we can either have the firearm shipped to us um, and, you know, you just call us up and we can arrange shipping. Or if it's in our, you know, territory area, we basically arrange pickups. And so um, basically we have a guy in our office that all he does is scheduling. So if you have one gun, he'll put you on the calendar as, hey, I've got one gun, but I got an agency locally that's got, you know, 30. So he'll throw that guy together and then they'll make a loop out of it. So um, yes, you know, we can, we'll make it work from anywhere between one gun. We also work with Michigan State Police who turns over between 700 and 1,000 every month. So we can make any quantity work. All right, next question. Does the process, ugh, I just lost the ability to read. Does the process <laughs> happen at individual stations or offsite? Offsite, they happen in our location. Um, we are in St. Louis, Missouri. We have offices in Louisiana, Florida, Carolinas, Maine, and Kansas right now. But it happens at our facility where our federal firearms license is recorded. Awesome. Now, this is going to be a tricky question. It's tricky for me anyways, because my California geography, even though we train there a couple of times a year, is horrible. How often do you pick up in the Livermore, California area? I'm going to have to Google um, So we would actually have those firearms shipped to us. Uh, we work with a representative group out there. Um, but basically, if you email our office, we would contact our guys in California, and they would come out. Uh, make sure it helped find out what you have. They would help pack the guns up and ship them out to us. So we don't have a regular schedule out in Livermore, um, but anytime that you're ready to go, I say whenever you have enough guns that you're happy with getting rid of them, call us and we can make it happen. And so they come out to the site and then they ship them back to you. Exactly, yes, we have one of our guys, if, if the agency wants them, um, we all have a guy that comes out, helps them do the inventory and do the packing and then we'll arrange for freight line ship back to us. Okay. Once the guns are shipped to us, we receive them, we do another inventory, uh, verify with the department what, we what we're supposed to receive is what we received. All right. Well, I think that answers the next question. So I'm gonna skip that one. And Don, who's a long time listener, uh, do you have any, or watcher rather, do you have any accounts in Jersey? Do you have anybody? Uh, yes. Okay. Yep. So um, our licensee up in Maine will serve New Jersey as well. Um, so Mac Mac Lynn is our licensee up there. Uh, he services the Northeast Corridor. Um, so yes, you can contact our office and I can give you his information or it's also on our website. Awesome. Man, lots of questions. Dad gum. Never had this many <laughs> questions. I'm in Washington. I presume state. Do I have to send to you from an FFL or can, do you, can agency ship direct? No, law enforcement, well, law enforcement agencies are exempt from the normal requirements that a federal firearms license would have to, but you can ship directly to us. Um, you are not required to maintain records on the guns. Once we receive them, we are required to do that, but you can ship them directly to us, yes. Um, if it makes the carrier happier, um, sometimes it does, we can provide you with a copy of our federal firearms license so that if anybody questions, hey, where's this going to, you can just hand them the license and say, it's going to these guys. Very cool. What's the turnaround from pickup to availability of the destruction video? <laughs> it depends on how many guns that we get. Um, right now, I've got about 2,500 in inventory, so I'm running a, probably about 60 to 75 days. Um, but we try and keep it within like a two to three month time frame. Um, because, you know, it's worrying when you send guns out the door and you don't know what has happened to them. Uh, the good thing is, is we do first in, first out. So if you ever had a question like, hey, where am I in line? You can call us and I can say, hey, I've got 25 guns ahead of you or I've got 250 guns ahead of you because um, we, you know, we can track them all the way through the process. Very cool. And I got lots of help with my California geography. Thank you, James and Anna. <laughs> Livermore is in the Bay Area, for those of you wondering. And let's see. So that was asked and answered. Here's a good question. Who pays the shipping? We do. It is completely free to the agency. We pay for the shipping materials and we pay for the shipping itself. So basically what you do is we have an Excel spreadsheet that says, hey, please list out your guns, make model serial number, your agency number. 
uh, the, send that to the guys in our office. They'll look at it and say, hey, it's X number of long guns, X number of handguns. They're going to need this size box. They arrange drop shipment of the packing materials to your agency. Uh, you pack them up, wrap it up, say, hey, I've got the guns shipped. We arrange for a truck line to come pick them up from your agency, and then they come to us. So it does not cost the agency anything. Awesome. No cost is good cost for police departments. That's uh, right. Doesn't mean it doesn't cost anything. Uh, let's see. Here's a question that I also want to know, and I think I've already asked you this. Do you sell the Gunbusters machine? Because I would we love do not. to have one in my garage. We do not. We uh, we have our licensees uh, throughout the country. Uh, we do not sell them individually. That's a shame, because I, I could use one just for tearing up crap that is i'm gonna go visit them in st louis you can come play with you can come play with ours in st louis i do i love to destroy things so (laughs) i'm so very much looking forward to that and i think the the question has already been answered you require a manifest for any other documents yes absolutely yes you know they 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 need to know as specifically what you're giving them just as you need to know specifically as to what they've been given and those are both reconciled out Uh, Okay. And we actually have a manifest that we can send out to any of the departments that need it. Here's a a great question from Victory. Hello, Victory. Uh, In Florida, they've got a statute that requires police departments to turn firearms for destruction over to the sheriff's office. Um, Yes. How does that work in Florida? Um, So I will tell you that uh, there are some agencies that will still turn them directly over to our licensee down there. Um, but basically what our licensee down there does is he works directly with uh, sheriff's departments. Um, it's similar to Michigan, who we work with. In Michigan, all de- all law enforcement agencies, uh, police departments and sheriff's, comp- uh, sheriff's offices turn their firearms over to state police and state police has to deal with the disposal and destruction. That's how it's supposed to work in Florida as well. I know there's one-offs and things, but in, in Florida, uh, Jim, who's our licensee down there, and his guys work with the sheriff's office to make sure they get those destructions done. Very cool. Do you accept all types of firearms? Mm, yes. So um, we have a couple of variances that allow us to accept defaced guns, um, which usually uh, licensees are typically it's illegal for anyone to possess. Uh, we possess them for destruction only. ATF gives us a variance that says we have seven days from receipt of the firearm to destroy defaced guns. So that's how we do it. Uh, Same thing with illegally modified guns, uh, cut down barrels, uh, converted to full auto guns. We can also accept full autos as well for destruction. Very cool. And last question, and then we'll get to the rest of the show. Uh, Is the recording held on your server or ours? How long is it retained? Yes. So I have a local copy on the computer that goes with our destruction unit. Um, The videos are provided to the department on a flash drive. So if you want to take that flash drive and upload it to your servers uh, for permanent record keeping, that's fine. We also upload all of our stuff to a cloud backup. Um, So if, you know, we would get a flood or a fire and lost that, we could recover all of our documents. Uh, More often than not, what happens is someone leaves the property or evidence room and someone's like, I don't know what happened to these files. Then we can provide a copy of, you know, here's what we have done the past three years for your department. Here's all the videos. Uh, um, Hopefully they can go to safe place. But the most requests we get is, Hey, I don't know what person before me did with this. Can you help me out? So we can. That's awesome. And my recommendation, like I, I love the, the file that they provide contains everything that you need to know to close out the life cycle of that particular item. Um, well, and I've, so the, fi- the, the, the lead, file yeah. name is actually the serial number of the gun. So it makes it searching for a specific gun very easy. It also burns the case or evidence number in there. So if you're looking for five guns from a specific case, you can just sort them that way. Um, instead of watching the video, it's contained within the file name itself. So you can sort through and see things much easier. Cool, cool, cool. Last, well, we have another question. I said last question. I was just lying because I didn't know that there was another question. But do you accept guns that were located in water and they're like stored, oh, yeah. continued packaged? And how do yep. you want them as, packaged? 
uh, kind of like biohazard guns um, because they are typically filled with mud or sand or dirt. Uh, yeah, with uh, more and more people seem to do magnet fishing. So we get more and more people are like, yeah, I found this gun in the water. So yeah, we can do those. Uh, sometimes those are a nightmare to identify because you know no one knows how long they've been in there. Uh, and they're rusted, you know, just solid. Um, but yeah, we can accept those as well. Very cool. All right. Well, that's a lot of questions. So I think people have gotten <laughs> some information here today, which is good. I'll just talk about the couple things I like about Gunbusters. I mean, one, I like Scott. I like those people. I've known them for a while. I can't believe it's only been 10 years that y'all have been around because they all seem to have been around for a long time. But you said 10 years. I'll go with 10 yep. years. Uh, <laughs> one, obviously, fewer guns in your vault. But I, the absolute accountability you get with them is next level. And it's something that that they will provide you better tracking than you have probably recorded in your own destructions if you've done them in the past. Feel free to reach out to Scott. They'll give you an example of what they provide, the agency, and all the information that they provide. I like the fact that it's fewer headaches than an auction. I'm not a huge fan of auctions. I mean, they never come back. To me, the main thing is that gone means gone. Once it's sent to them, it does not come back to you. The only thing that comes back is a little file, and you can upload that file on a cloud-based server, and it will be available and associated with that item in perpetuity as long as you're on the cloud. So if we're talking about cloud, talk to the folks at Tracker. But so I don't want to just only talk about that. We'll go over some – it seems kind of pointless to go over these uh, little things now because we've had actually much better information. I don't, uh, Selena, I'll have to get back to that question because I'd have to read it again. But holler at me and I will get that question specifically answered. Uh, evidence basics, you know, we teach, we preach. Evidence could be, uh, firearms evidence is one of those exceptions. We recommend submitting them unsealed. We recommend that they're submitted in visibly safe, unloaded condition. Now, Bree, who brought up the water gun question, a lot of times those guns are going to be loaded when they are submitted. You know, if you've got a gun that's recovered, especially by, you know, a forensic dive team, they're going to recover the gun. They're going to put it in water. They're not going to unload it. They're not going to rack the slide underwater and try to do anything with it because it doesn't work. Uh, so there can be guns that are submitted that are not visibly safe and cannot and will not be made visibly safe. But whenever it is practicable, we recommend that you do so. And also to re-verify the serial numbers. That's one of the reasons, the top reasons why we recommend that guns are submitted unsealed. You can make a business case for doing it another way. That's just what we teach. Um, and I will come back and ask. We'll do, I'll do the last questions towards the end because it's throwing me off my rhythm. So you're still getting questions. This makes me jealous and sad. Because you've gotten like 50 questions and I have gotten like 12. And that's four years and one day you've gotten more questions. So that, that still hurts. But we will go back and answer them. Um, here's a quiz. Which of these is visibly safe? And that one or that one? I hope you can see the screen. Otherwise, this quiz makes no sense. And really, I hope you can tell that, that that's the, the gun with the bullets in it. That's not visibly safe. That was more tongue-in-cheek. It wasn't an actual quiz. We recommend storing firearms in a manner that prevents cross-contamination and oxidization. And we also recommend storing them in a manner that prevents damage to the, the, or alteration to the firing pin, muzzle, or barrel interior. If you're using baling wire, and baling wire is not a great material for tagging firearms, but I've seen it more times than one. I've seen it all across the country in agencies where baling wire is routinely used. It is not a good material to use to tag firearms. That will damage the barrel of the gun. So if it's ever used for forensic analysis, they're going to get that mark of the baling wire on the firearm. But we're not here to talk about all that fun stuff. Storing items under increased security, storing firearms in a temperature-controlled environment, these are just the basics. And if you take one of our classes, we'll give you all the basics and more. I really wanted to kind of talk about two things in specific. And it begins with another quiz. Now, without looking or Googling, 
how many separate disqualifications exist under 18 U.S. Code, Section 922, Chapter 44, which is the federal law that lists out prohibitive stat prohibited statuses, people that cannot possess a gun federally. Does anyone know the answer? Yeah, see, I got zero responses to my question. <laughs> zero. That well, felons is one, but how many separate types of qualifications? This is hurt so bad. I will tell you it's nine. All right. The answer is nine. There are nine prohibitive statuses under federal law, folks that cannot possess a firearm. Now, most agencies out there will, if they're if they're checking eligibility, if you're going to return a firearm to someone, you'll do one of two things typically. You'll either do a QR or a QH on NCIC, which is a rap or a criminal history, a criminal history or a rap sheet. Now, the question I have for you is how many of those nine prohibited statuses are caught through a QH or QR? If anyone knows that answer, Bueller, Bueller. We have one, it's actually better than four. So it's actually better, six. So if you run a rap sheet, you're only gonna catch six of the nine prohibitive statuses and you're not even guaranteed to get those six. So hopefully you're tracking with me. One of the things that a QH or QR does not track and does not retain are people that have been adjudicated as a mental defective or have been committed to a mental institution. A person committed to a mental institution, and this is a civil commitment, not just a voluntary commitment, I believe, uh, they are ineligible to possess a firearm. And that's not going to be picked up on a QH or QR. Number six, dishonorably discharged from the U.S. Armed Forces or, on, or discharged under dishonorable conditions. And then seven, folks that have renounced their citizenship. So... How do you find those people? Well, fortunately, there is an answer. There is another database, um, and that's the NICS Easy Check, the same background check that firearm FFL dealers check when they're selling firearms to the, the public. Um, it's actually available to law enforcement. So my recommendation, one of the things that we teach in our training classes is that you not rely on QH or QR inquiries on NCIC to determine whether you can give a gun back to someone. Now, obviously, if you're in California, this doesn't apply to you, so you've probably already tuned out and dropped off. So I apologize. You've got a whole system designed to do that. But for the rest of us, the other 49 states, uh, access to NICS. You have access. As a law enforcement agency, you can access the exact same database that FFL dealers run on every single person when they buy a firearm. And that's the federal government's solution to determining eligibility for purchase, well, that determination is the same for receipt and return as well. You can access that through LEAP, which is the FBI CGIS portal. You can Google that LEAP, L-E-E-P, FBI CGIS. I tried to provide the, the link, but that's the portal. They used to call it the LEO online portal. So my recommendation to agencies is Use the NICS Easy Check through the LEAP portal for determining firearms eligibility. Hopefully that helped. But I can't click the little slide here. It's, it's frozen. So now we're about to watch a moment of panic. All right. Another huge problem. And this is I, – I typically like to provide solutions. Um, my solution to researching eligibility for firearms – is the NICS easy check, but we don't really have a good solution for the next one. one of the, as I go across the country, one of the things that I found over and over and over again is there are no training programs, save for the state of California, which has an excellent one, to teach people how to safely handle firearms or how to identify firearms or how to verify the serial number on a firearm. There's virtually zero training out there across the country specifically for that. And I was at the Kate conference uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I was talking to a friend named Rose, and Rose has a cool uh, accent, and she it was going out to talk about guns, but she said, you should do it yourself. So I was thinking, 
I need to talk to Scott and we need to work on something. You know, that, that training doesn't exist, but that training needs to exist. So one of the things that, that Scott and I are going to partner on in the next few months is working on a training class that issue that addresses all of these particular issues. It'll be online and completely free. But we will teach people how to handle safely, how to handle firearms safely. We've got um, armors, we've got gunsmiths, we've got firearms instructors that can talk about these things in great detail. We'll flesh it out. We'll talk about black powder. We'll talk about rifles. We'll talk about shotguns. We'll talk about handguns. We'll talk about semiotics. We'll talk about revolvers. The whole nine yards, we're going to do this online, and it'll be available to you 24-7. We'll also show you what visibly safe looks like, what it means. I realized a couple of years ago when I started teaching these classes across the country that a lot of people, especially civilians, weren't grown up. They didn't grow up in Texas. They didn't grow up around guns. And if you've not grown up around guns or if you've never handled a firearm and now you find yourself in an evidence vault asked to determine whether this gun has been made safe or not, that's a hard call. Uh, and, and quite honestly, it, it puts you at great risk because you're making a judgment that will impact other people's safety down the road. And you want to make sure that you're qualified to do so. So we will put this video series together. I don't think it'd be a series. It might just be one or two, but it will be an online training course that provides instruction on all four of those areas. Scott and his team are great resources for figuring out where the serial number on a gun might be or identifying a gun that is difficult to identify. So there is a halftime resource that ain't me. Uh, reach out to Scott and his team if you've got questions in the interim, but we're excited about doing this. We're going to go down to the to the uh, their facility in St. Louis and film this where it'll be well shot, well executed, and very clear and clearly lined out and delineated. Because what we realize, we, there is no safe training resource out there for evidence custodians. It just doesn't exist. So taking Rose's advice, well, if it doesn't exist, go do it. Make it happen. Yeah. So thank you, Rose. It's a great idea. We weren't talking about this, but it's applied to a lot of different things. So be looking for that in the next few months. It's not going to come out next week. It's going to be something that we're going to execute um, and, and have shot for us. Um, but we really feel like you doing your job, you would be safer with training like that if you've never been provided training at any level. And, and certainly, if now you've secured your own training, the folks that come behind you, we just feel like this would be a valuable resource. And that's one of the cool things about partnering with different types of companies is partner with Gunbusters. They're going to be able to provide the expertise that we need and a facility and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of guns so that we have stuff to shoot. Uh, and by shoot, I don't mean shoot. I mean <laughs> shoot as in shoot. So I realize I'm mixing my metaphors there. So that's something we're excited about coming out in the future. This is another cool thing about partnership. Uh, it will be free. It will be online. And it will be available as soon as we get it produced. And we'll have Scott come on and announce when we're ready to, to release it again. Absolutely. In the, in the meantime, uh, come see Scott at one of our training classes or one of his representatives. Uh, same yep. thing with Tracker. Come say hello to the folks at Tracker. If you're, They'll be out. Both Tracker and Gun Busters will be at our Kansas City, Missouri class. I'm excited about that. I've never been to Kansas City, even though their Royals are not doing great this year. I've never had true Kansas City barbecue, so that's important to me. Oh, and I also want to teach the class. But uh, any questions before we hang up on you? See? You got like 30. I got nine. And hearing none, I think we will call this one. But before we do, I want to tell you about our next few shows. Next time on the Evidence Show, show something really, really cool. Uh, I just can't tell you about it just yet. I mean, I've planned it out. I've written it. And it's, it's almost ready to go, maybe. But we will be there on May 18th. And it will be something cool. Hopefully a show that has like 40 different questions asked from the people. Oh, wait, there's stuff. Okay. Make sure it's the 
Oh, can I show you the nine reasons? Yes, let me go. Let me go back. Okay, let me go back real quick. Just close your eyes because if you if you watch this, you might have a seizure. The nine prohibitive statuses. One, if you're under indictment or convicted in any court that's basically eligible by, for imprisonment over a year. Most of us would call that a felony, but if you're subject to being imprisoned for over a year, that's a disqualifier. If you're a fugitive from justice, got warrants, that's one. Unlawful user or addicted to any controlled substance. Now, unlawful user is subject to interpretation. Uh, like in Oregon, I mean, I, I, I don't know that anyone would be an unlawful user because you can carry a usable quantity of heroin and, and everyone's cool with it. But I love Oregon regardless, it's just the same uh, because they have many, many trout streams and it's a beautiful state. Uh, adjudicated as a mental defective or committed to a mental institution, that's one, an illegal alien unlawfully in the country, dishonorable discharge, renounce your citizenship. The number eight deals with basically protective orders and domestic violence and number nine, well, actually, it's stalking. Uh, those are intimate partner relationships, court orders, people that are subject to a restraining order or a protective order. Number nine is convicted of any misdemeanor crime of, of violence. So thank you for that question because it was a question, and now I feel like I got asked a question. I feel happy about that. <laughs> Beth is excited about Kansas City. Oh, answer Selena's question. Let's see. Let me go back. All right, since I got a question from Selena and one to answer Selena's question, uh, for firearms that have been entered into NIBIN slash IBIS and have been tested by labs, do we notify you of those items so the parts don't end up being sold barrel, like the barrel? Yes, we can definitely do that. Um, you know, if you have certain guns that you do not want uh, the barrels sold, you just let us know. We can mark them um, for destruction, and we can do it that way. Cool. Just let us know. We can handle it. That answers that question. So now we don't have to email. What is the <laughs> the website for the background check that we mentioned? What I would actually do. Just giving you the website will not give you necessarily access to that background check. Your agency has to sign up for the LEAP FBI CGIS portal. And if you will look up the CGIS website or LEAP, literally if you Google LEAP CGIS FBI, it will get you to the site. The registration for the site is not very difficult at all. Most agencies are already eligible to participate in that. Because if your agency has a dispatch and your dispatch accesses information through NCIC, whether it's through your state uh, state connection to it, you're probably eligible, but it'll take a little bit. Hopefully that answers the question. Poorly, but, but answers it. So we'll go back to the end. Our next show, May 18th, June 15th, July 27th. Hold those dates loosely. Sometimes they change, but we will definitely try to do one each month. So, Scott, thanks for being here. Uh, Thank you for having me. Excited to have you all on board, and we'll be doing some cool stuff in the future with them. Looking forward to that. Uh, the rest of you, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching and being on with us today. Have a great week, and we'll see you next month. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out anytime. Have a good one.